Hello, I'm Elisa Manzotti, CEO and founder of BioInsights, and uh, a very warm welcome to the Cell and Gene Therapy Insights webinar with Sangha Ben. So, Cell and Gene Therapy Insights is the leading publication in the field focused on the unique challenges and the exciting advances in the translation and commercialization of cell and gene therapies. Working with our senior editor, Professor Chris Mason, and our international advisory board, we identify the critical issues across the manufacturing pathway. And this month sees a publication of our spotlight focused on raw and starting materials, which you can access free of charge, and if you're not already a member, we'll send you your access details shortly. As part of this spotlight, I'm delighted to be hosting this webinar with Stan Gabane, which is going to provide some insight into a critical part of the cell and gene therapy supply chain. We'll hear from our two speakers in a 30-minute presentation, which will be followed by a Q&A session. And we'd love to invite you to share your thoughts and your questions with us then, which you can post using the little box under the webinar panel. So now I'd like to hand over to our two speakers. We have Natasha Bogoshin, who's Product Manager for Cell Therapy for Sangavan, and Dr. Katie Campbell, Senior Research Engineer for Sangavan. Over to you. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you all for joining today. So we're just going to take a quick look on what we will discuss today. I'll, I'll start with a very brief overview of St. Gobain and then move to an introduction of the subject uh, of interest today, which is material science and cell therapy. And then I'll give an industry case study before handing off to Dr. Katie Campbell, who will take you through several more internal case studies. And as Lisa said, there will be plenty of time at the end for questions, so please feel free to submit at your convenience. So St. Cobain is a very large and a very old company. It's actually 351 years old and about 40 billion euros in sales with operations worldwide. At its roots, St. Cobain is a materials and manufacturing company. And in the life science sector, we focus on fluid transfer solutions, specifically for medical devices, analytical equipment, and the bioprocessing space. In bioprocessing, we like to look at the products for every process step during drug manufacturing, whether that drug be a protein, a small molecule, or even a cell therapy. And digging deeper, we also like to highlight all the materials and processes that are required to achieve these products, looking at processes from extrusion and molding to welding and assembly, and using a wide range of materials on the high performance side, as well as custom formulations. So like St. Cobain globally, uh, the life science sector is also global, and we have multiple material and processing capabilities spread across the globe and often duplicated sites for these capabilities. So Dr. Katie Campbell comes to us from our R&D group, um, actually from the Northborough R&D Center. And as you can see, we have three major R&D centers and supporting local sites that are all focused on different aspects of material science from material formulation, process technology, uh, and modeling in Northborough to our extensive leachables and extractables capabilities in our Shanghai facility. So now onto the core of today's material, materials and their place in cell therapy. So let's start with some quick definitions. So material science is really the study of the relationship of material properties and performance on function. On the other side, cell therapy is, at its most generic definition, the use of whole cells as a drug. So what, is, what do these two things have to do with each other? Well, today we hope to show you how several material properties, um, including but not limited to permeability, machinability, chemical resistance, all of these properties can play a role in the manufacturing process for cell therapy. And really why appropriate material selection is critical for successful scale up or scale out. First, let's discuss leachables and extractables. And just for reference, this is how our case studies will be set up today. We'll introduce a material property, and then we'll dig into a specific example where that property was studied. So to start, it's important to start by differentiating leachables and extractables, because often they're used synonymous with each other. So extractables are what can come out of material, and this is typically under aggressive conditions, sometimes labeled as a worst case situation, and these conditions can be elevated temperature, extended contact time, aggressive solvents, or any combination of those, uh, those elements. 
On the other hand, leachables are what actually do come out of the material during typical application conditions. So these conditions would be driven by the, the customer application or the specifications. Often cases, as you can imagine, with all the aggressive conditions, extractables will typically encompass all of leachables. But this is sometimes not the case, and that's something to, to ensure that you understand. But extractables and leachables can all come from the same sources, um, from the material. And that's really anything. I mean, it can be additives, residues, degradation products, the ligamers, you name it. If it's in the material, it can be a potential leachable or extractable. So when you're trying to study these different compounds, it is crucial to understand that the migration is not only dependent on its diffusion through the polymer, but it's also its solubility in the polymer. So it's important to have studies that are comprehensive and look at a number of considerations, whether that be extraction ratios, solutions, temperature, duration. And with that, in order to properly quantify and qualify these compounds, you have to have sufficiently sensitive analysis techniques and tools. And, and we'll get to that in the industry case study where you know, even very low amounts of these compounds can be detrimental to the process. So to start the case study, it, it's important to kind of, let's start with typical bioprocessing containers, because these happen to be the material uh, of interest in this case study. So to align everyone, disposable bioprocessing containers are typically made from multiple layers. Um, so they're, they're not uh, monolayer films like you may see on the cell therapy side, but they're actually uh, multi-layer films that each film layer has a different property that it contributes to the overall film. So I've, I've highlighted one structure on the left that is pretty common, a polyolefin fluid contact, an EVOH barrier, and, and some sort of strength layer like a nylon. And, and this was the type of bag that, um, that on the right-hand side you can see that three bags of this type um, produce a, a wide range of leachables and extractables. And, this is one indication that you know, the solvent really does matter. So in water you see uh, a few, in IPA you see a lot more. So why is this important? So this is the Amgen case study, and this is the, the infamous Ergafos 168 case study. And just to orient anyone who, who wasn't aware of this case study, Ergafos 168 is an oxidizer that is used in film extrusion. It's very common to be used in film extrusion um, when dealing with polyolefin fluid contact layers like LDPE or ULDPE. Now, what happened here is that the 168 did its job. It oxidized during the process. And then it was gamma sterilized and it turned into a separate compound. And what happened with that separate compound, noted here as BDTBPP, um, was it actually ended up being a cytotoxin for the Cho cell lines that Amgen was using. So most interestingly here is it actually became detrimental to the Cho cell line at a thousand times lower than the FDA reporting threshold for additives of this type. So this goes back to the really needing the sensitivity analysis to understand even that things that are very small amounts can have a profound impact on the process. So of course this prompted a study um, by many involved to understand what was happening. So they looked at a lot of what variations could happen that may impact or uh, either negatively or positively, the cell growth of this specific Cho cell line. So as you can see, they saw that an increased concentration of the oxidized ergophos in the film and of the sterilized version of ergophos in the container increased the negative impact, as did the concentration of that component that physically leached into the container. So all three of those things are, were tied together. One interesting finding was they saw that the less time post-irradiation um, the more negative the impact on the cell growth. So that was, that was an interesting finding. So what could be done to resolve this and what was done? So if you look at all the options that could be used to eliminate this detrimental effect of this compound, it could be, well, you completely remove the predecessor from the formulation, but the reason it's in there is to do a job, is to prevent oxidation. Um, of the film, so it could lead to poor film properties if you just completely removed it. You could optimize it in the formulation, and that actually was an approach that was taken, where they saw that if you even just cut the original ergophos weight percent in half, you were able to avoid the detrimental effects to cell density. 
You can also look at controlling the oxidation through the alteration of the extrusion parameters, but this is also very difficult to adjust because you have to not just look at one parameter. You have to look at multiple, um, two being temperature and output, and then obviously trying to trace that back to um, how much of the compound ends up being leached. And of course, you could use a different antioxidant, um, though then you get into concerns of characterization and if there's other uh, antioxidants that are as well characterized as ergophosphon 6 -8. So this is just a taste of, of an industry, industry case study, um, and it really points to kind of the emerging interest in leachables and extractables and understanding them and also being able to quantify and qualify them appropriately. So I'm going to pass it off to Dr. Katie Campbell, who is going to walk you through several uh, internal, internal case studies that will look at other material properties beyond leachables and extractables. Um, and then at the end, we'll hopefully have some questions as well. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. So to start with, this first case study um, for our internal discussion relates to the importance of gas permeability through a polymer. So permeability of materials to both gases and liquids is critical for cell culture, as well as a wide range of other applications, ranging from packaging to biosensors. Permeability of polymers can be impacted by a number of factors, including the size or physical state of the penetrating molecule, the morphology and other properties of the polymer, the solubility of the permeating molecule in the polymer matrix, and the presence of fillers, humidity, and, and plasticizers in the polymer. Here we show the water vapor transmission rate and permeability of carbon dioxide and oxygen through several commonly used polymers in medical applications. As you can see, polymer permeability varies widely with FEP and high-density polyethylene here at the bottom of the chart versus silicone, which is highly permeable to both carbon dioxide and oxygen as well as water. The permeability of CO2 in particular through silicone tubing is important for this next case study. In this case, Invitec was evaluating silicone tubing as part of an assembly containing, the, containing cell culture media. They noted a rapid increase in pH above the target range in the media when the media-filled silicone tubing was in air as well as under incubator conditions. The results shown here for pH are measured for the tubing in air and compared versus other common tubing materials. As you can see, the media pH after two hours in the silicone tubing has increased significantly. Invitec came to us to understand why the pH increases and how, how they could prevent this from happening. Permeability of the silicone tubing to gases turns out to be very important to maintaining target pH in the cell culture media. CO2 dissolved in the media and in the atmosphere outside the tubing drives towards equilibrium, and the high permeability of CO2 through silicone relative to other materials accelerates the equilibrium process, which results in an increase in pH. We propose three different solutions in this case. First, eliminating or minimizing the silicone tubing length to reduce the surface area available for carbon dioxide transport, as well as the volume of media impacted at any given time. Another option was to raise the incubator carbon dioxide above 5%. 5% is a general standard practice because most plastic culture systems and medias um, have buffering capability and the, the incubator has much lower CO, or the plastics have much lower CO2 permeability than silicon. Lastly, we suggested adding a supplemental buffer to the media for extra buffering capacity. This next case study is related to the chemical compatibility of polymers in cryopreservation applications where DMSO is used as a cryoprotectant. DMSO is commonly used at 10 weight percent in water as a cryoprotectant due to comparably low toxicity relative to other water miscible liquids such as ethanol. DMSO protects the cell in two ways. First, it partially solubilizes the cell membrane, which makes it more resistant to puncturing by ice crystals. And it also reduces ice formation by disrupting the formation of large crystals, which are more likely to damage the cell. However, DMSO has notoriously poor compatibility with some plastics due to reactivity. It's therefore extremely important to consider this when selecting materials for cryopreservation applications. In general, chemical exposure can impact many polymer properties, particularly when incompatible materials are used together. Properties that can be impacted include strength, flexibility, color or surface appearance, dimensions, weight, and extractables. Chemicals negatively in interact with polymers via three basic modes. First, by attacking, chemically attacking the polymer chain. Second, by causing physical changes in the polymer. And third, by stress cracking, 
from interaction of the chemical with mold is in or ex external stresses in the plastic. External factors such as temperature, pressure, and con concentration, as well as the length of exposure can all impact chemical resistance as well. You can see here with this here when comparing the pure DMSO resistance of several polymers at two different temperatures. For example, ETFE shows excellent resistance at 20 degrees C, but the re resistance to DMSO decreases at higher temperatures. In this case study, the customer requested the closing up of cryomedia bottles to bags. The entire bag system, including both the bag and the tubing, were required to be DMSO resistant. Additionally, the system required sterile docking and the bag shape was critical to being able to properly drain. In the bag design shown here on the right, FEP was selected as the bag material. FEP and fluoropolymers in general have excellent chemical resistance to the, due to the basic chemical structure of the polymer chain. C-Flex tubing was selected in this case for two reasons. First, the ability to sterile weld, and second, C-Flex is considered DMSO friendly. Lastly, the bag was designed in this custom V-shape for easy draining. This next case study relates to sterilization methods. There are many sterilization techniques available, and a given polymer may not be compatible with all methods. It's important to select materials and processes that are compatible with each other. The thermal and moisture stability of a polymer is important to steam sterilization, um, where products are exposed to saturated steam at high temperatures. Both gamma and E-beam irradiation are forms of ionizing radiation sterilization that do not generate heat or moisture. Gamma uses lower dose rates at longer exposure times, while E-beam requires less exposure time due to higher dose rates. Both forms can deg degrade a polymer and result in loss in physical properties, so it's important to ensure material compatibility with the method employed. Lastly, ethylene oxide, or ETO gas, can be used for sterilizing items that are sensitive to other methods. ETO p penetrates porous materials and can even penetrate some plastics. In this example, the customer requested a syringe set for sampling and specifically requested no polycarbonate be used. Additionally, all materials needed to be gamma stable. The assembly needed to be capable of handling the weight of hanging syringes, as you can see here. In this case, the solution required multiple material and compatibility considerations. Polypropylene syringes were chosen as a gamma-stable polycarbonate alternative with PVC tubing for sterile docking and gamma stability. All of the connections and fittings were chosen to be compatible with the tubing and syringes along with being gamma-stable. Due to material compatibility, two different gamma-stable glues were identified, one for each connection shown here. One glue was identified for the lure connection to the syringe and another for the connector to the tubing. The system was designed based on the requirements of the application and the resulting system that was manufactured is shown here in this figure. For our last case study, uh, we're going to focus on materials and processing. So it's important to remember that product design is a combination of material selection and processing expertise. There are many ways to produce polymers and choosing the right method is dependent on a number of factors, including the intricacy or complexity of the design, the size scale, the machinability of the material, the thickness of the material, flexibility requirements, as well as dimensional tolerances. So, for example, if a design is very complex and requires tight dimensional tolerances, 3D printing technology may be an ideal manufacturing process, whereas melt extrusion would not be. <clears throat> In this case study, we were asked to design an insert for the centrifugation of bags. The bags were settling in a poor orientation during centrifugation, which resulted in wrinkling increasing and ultimately tears in the bag. An insert was designed for the centrifuge bucket to keep the bags upright and maintain a flat surface through as much of the bag as possible. Tight tolerances were, were required to ensure the insert mimicked the bucket geometry to prevent gaps between the bag and the bucket. We chose in this, in this application Delrin acetyl resin from DuPont um, as the material of construction because of excellent machinability, mechanical strength and rigidity, dimensional control, and it's also a lightweight, high-performance material. In this case, choosing both the right material and machining methods were critical to the success of the solution. To begin to wrap up, 
um, as we've discussed in many of our case studies, uh, FEP is an excellent solution, um, for particularly for many cell therapy applications where um, FEP can be used. So it's processed without any additives, plasticizers, or animal-derived components. So the risk for leachables and extractables is very low. Um, FEP, as mentioned previously, is also chemically and biologically inert, making it ideal for DMSO um, type applications, particularly cryopreservation. Um, FEP is permeable to oxygen and water, but impermeable to water vapor, which makes it great for cell culture type applications. And FEP maintains physical properties across a wide temperature range from negative 200 C all the way up to positive 200 C. So it's great in cryopreservation applications because the flexibility is maintained even at very low temperatures. And lastly, FEP is transparent to visible light near UV and near IR for microscopy and other niche applications where transparency may be required. So what are the take-home messages here? First, there are many material factors to consider beyond biocompatibility, many of which we discussed today, including permeability, machinability, sterilization compatibility, chemical resistance, and mechanical properties. This list is by no means exhaustive, and specific requirements depend significantly on the application. Also, selecting the right material and process requires specific expertise, including a thorough understanding of an application, deep material science knowledge for both material selection and material processing consideration, and flexible processing capabilities to meet a wide range of design and material requirements. Lastly, it's important to think about the impact of materials on your process early in development, as material selection and product design are critical for every component. Um, with that, after this last poll question, we will take questions. Thank you, Katie. The last poll question should be showing up on your screen now. It's, do you believe material selection is important for the success in cell therapy manufacturing? With that, Elisa, I'll hand it back to you. Great. Thank you very much, Natasha and Katie. Okay, so I thought we'd now just kick off our Q&A session. Um, we've had a few questions coming in. So let's start off um, by asking you, what sort of validation can you provide with the Sankabane products? Great question. Thank you, Elisa. So validation is, can be very specific to the application. So as a standard approach, we typically would look at um, providing a validation guide for our products, which includes everything from ISO to USP tests that have been performed. Beyond that, we certainly like to understand the specific application to understand if there are specific requirements and testing that can be added in addition to the validation guide um, to help with the evaluation of the product. Great. And then we had another question coming in, which was asking about what volumes are typically required in order to have a custom solution created. So custom solutions, sometimes people are, get concerned by the word custom. Um, they can relate it to very large minimum order quantities, very long lead times. Um, but actually, with a lot of the processes that we have, and the capabilities we have in, in product design and manufacturing allows us to maintain very low minimum order quantities for custom products on the order of 10. Um, and lead times aren't drastically affected um, beyond the, the project development because of the, the flexibility of our manufacturing processes. Okay. Great. Okay. And in your sort of perspective, what do you think is the most important property of a material to look at? Very interesting question, and hopefully by, by kind of some of the case studies that, that Katie went through, we can all agree that there's not just one property that can drive a material's performance. It's very dependent on the application. Um, it's also very dependent on the, the usage of it. So take the, the Invitec example. Silicone tubing is a great tubing for pumping, and it's very widely used in the industry. Um, in the certain application that Invitec had where they needed to maintain um, a CO2 uh, balance, it became very apparent that silicone wasn't going to be the appropriate choice um, potentially for that application. So it's really diving into the application and under understanding material specifications and, and not just trying to push a very specific material onto every application um, without knowing potentially what the, what the underlying requirements are. Absolutely. Okay, and so another question that has come in is, how do you consider or measure the loss of cells within a material system?
Sorry, Lisa, can you repeat that one? Yeah, so it came in. It says, how do you consider or measure loss of cells in the material system? Excellent. Okay. So this is also, I mean, it would depend on the application. One thing we can, of course, look at is understanding, um, obviously, I think it's pretty wide known in the industry that protein absorption um, really does dr drive cell adhesion or cell sticking um, to a material. So understanding the mechanisms of protein adhesion on surfaces um, is an is avenue that we could take to understand cell loss. Um, obviously, there are some more high-level experiments we could do in terms of cells in, cells out, but really understanding the principle and understanding of why we're losing cells, not just that we are losing cells, I think requires an intricate balance of understanding material and biological interfaces specifically with proteins. Mm. Okay, great. And uh, there's a question now that's just come in as well, talking about are the tubings reactive to gamma irradiation? I'm, I'm going to let Katie Campbell take this one in terms of um, looking at gamma compatibility with different tubing materials. Okay, great. Yep. So gamma compatibility depends significantly on the material that you're looking at. Um, there are many materials that are gamma stable, many that are not. Um, for materials that are not gamma stable, they tend to undergo what's called chain scission, um, where the polymer molecular weight is broken down and you lose physical properties and the material becomes brittle. So it's important to match up the material to the gamma stability if you're interested in gamma and in, in, in having gamma as the sterilization technique. Um, yeah. Thanks. Okay. And another question that's come in. So how do you evaluate the influence of cell material interactions on the final cell product? Excellent question. So really, it, it, you have to obviously first define um, what qualities and attributes you're looking at the final cell product. Is it viability? Is it phenotype? Um, is it number? Uh, and of course, all those things are quite measurable. But when you're looking at the influence, influence of a cell material, it can become a lot harder to, to know the exact interaction. And I think it goes back to looking, again, at that material biological interface. One thing absolutely to look at is leachables and extractables. Um, it, given the indus, uh, industry, industrial case study, excuse me, of um, Amgen's uh, results that they had in terms of a leachable having uh, impact on their cell growth at a thousand times less than the FDA reporting limit, I think just drives the importance of really understanding what's in your material and what can come out of your material, especially in cell therapy where there's not a final filtration step. Um, so all of those things that are coming out of your material are going to end up in the end product. Um, so really understanding that, quantifying it, qualifying it um, is extremely important. And I think what's helpful is having an idea from your suppliers in terms of what, are in, what is in the materials and also understanding that extractables and leachables are both important to consider. Absolutely. Okay, and the next question is regarding some of the data that you ran through. So was the high pH seen in media when using silicon tubing sterilization specific? I'm going to let Katie Campbell answer this one as well. Uh, in this case, the, the high pH um, seen was not sterilization specific. Okay, great. And uh, could you also come in? Oh, sorry, Clara. <laughs> no, it, it was due to the permeability of the material. Um, so sterilization was not a factor in that case study. Okay, great. And so could you possibly comment on your understanding of different plastic properties on the adsorption of chemical molecules, growth factors, et cetera, and which one sort of absorbs the least? This is certainly a million-dollar question. <laughs> so I think a lot of people in the industry are really trying to pinpoint what are specific uh, surface properties that may drive um, biological interactions. And let's speak specifically on maybe protein absorption um, or absorption of other chemical and um, biological molecules. So there, obviously there are some um, great papers out there that, that pinpoint maybe looking at hydrophobic versus hydrophilic surfaces, which really relate excuse me, to the surface energy of the material. Um, that's certainly seem to be a driving force in terms of looking at protein absorption, but it's very hard to pinpoint that as the only, um, the only material property. And, and because the reason for that is surface energy is, is also made up um, by a large amount of properties that feed into surface energy. So you have, of course, you have surface energy, you also have topography, um, you have surface chemistry. Uh, so there's lots of things that you need to look out for. And I think um, 
a lot of what we have to do is, is again, understand um, what the chemical or biological molecule of interest is and drive it back to a material science property. So it's dependent not only on the material, it's also dependent on the molecule. And so that's where really collaboration and understanding of the application is important in order to streamline that understanding. Absolutely. Okay, and our next question. So as FEP is permeable to gas, if we freeze media in an FEP bag, is there a risk of pH alteration on the culture media? Excellent question. Um, so yes, FEP being extremely permeable to CO2 and O2 is excellent at culture conditions. And I think it's important to remember that permeability actually follows the Arrhenius equation. So at high temperatures, it's going to be very permeable to gases. When you get down to cryopreservation temperatures, which is, I think, about minus, minus 196 C, not a lot of molecules are able to move at that temperature. And so when you drive down the temperature, you're also driving down the permeability characteristics. So actually, this attribute of FEP seemingly disappears at lower temperatures. Great. OK. And so how are you addressing the increasing need for analytics throughout processing? for example, inspection modalities such as NIR? Thank you. Great question. So I think, obviously, being a, a, both the manufacturing, manufacturer and assembly of a lot of our products, looking at processing analytics is, is very important and understanding, okay, are we, are we developing, are we processing the material that we know to be using in our product? So we are vertically integrated in the sense that we have lots of control over the processing of our film um, and then, of course, of the manufacturing of a lot of our products, including our floor polymer bags. Um, so I think we are always looking for ways to, to add analytics to processing. But also we, we do a lot in terms of characterizing our products as well, um, using techniques like AFM and FTIR or NIR, uh, GCMS, um, things to really look at the material from every material science aspect and then taking that information and tying it to the application and looking at how may those materials impact uh, sorry, material properties impact the application, but also being able to understand when we change one of those properties, whether it be for a, a product development or, or process development, does that have an effect? And so it really ties back to understanding our learnings and increasing our learnings in tying material science properties to cell therapy uh, applications and, and beyond. Fantastic. Okay, and uh, are non-treated tissue culture flasks truly not treated at all, or are they simply not treated with coatings relating to cell adhesion? So this question is, is it can be quite dependent on the supplier of the flask. So there are untreated flasks, they tend to be in polystyrene or polycarbonate, that, that are purely kind of untreated those materials. You do have tissue culture polystyrene um, and tissue culture polycarbonate, which tend to be treated with a chemical uh, process, whether it be a corona or a plasma, that actually is, is modifying the very top layer of the material, um, but keeping the bulk the same as the polycarb or polystyrene. So I, I would say, yes, they are treated. There are many different ways, and, and, and I'm actually going to let Katie comment on a few of the other ways that you can treat a material beyond just surface modification. Um, because I think it's important to understand that modifying material um, can take many different forms. So there are also etching methods, physical methods. Um, there's grafting of polymers, deposition of proteins. Um, there are many ways to modify the surface um, of, a, of a culture flask to achieve the desired effect. And it just depends on whether or not you're looking for cell adhesion or not um, and, and what type of cells you want to adhere. Okay, and then I think we have our last question, which is, which is the most common plastic used in cell therapy? Great question. I, I think this would depend who you ask. I mean, I, I, cell therapy is a maturing industry, so there's lots of different materials being used. You, of course, have the materials coming from the blood banking world, the, the PVCs and some of the EVAs. You have some coming from the pharma world, the more of the bioprocessing containers that I showed early on, the multi-layer constructions um, with the barrier, which are great when you're looking at bioreactors, um, especially on microcarriers, we're actually controlling the oxygen through sparging. So there's lots of materials that are, that are 
feeling their way into the industry. And, and honestly, there's different materials and different applications require different materials. And I, I don't think the purpose of today's presentation um, hopefully was to show that there's not one right material for every application. There's often times that you have to, to modify the material and do application-specific material selection instead of, uh, instead of the understanding that there's one perfect material for everything. Um, we did overview FEP. It's a floral polymer we work with. Um, we find it's great for cell culture and cryopreservation preservation applications. It's not great for media storage. Um, FEP for media storage would, would not work because of the oxygen permeability, um, especially at those room, room temperature and elevated temperatures. So I think the point of today is to understand that more looking at standard off-the-shelf materials um, that can maybe retrofit an application, really what, what we try to do is look at the application and choose a material specific to that. So making it much more application specific, and again, it goes back to understanding those material properties that may drive success. And, and the hope is by doing a more in-depth analysis of the application and, and therefore a more specific material selection, we're actually able to yield better results in the industry. Fantastic. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed, Natasha and Katie, for a fantastic presentation. And thank you very much to our audience for some brilliant questions. Um, we will be sending out a recording of the webinar on Thursday this week, which you can access free of charge. So look out for that email from us. Um, but with that, I would just like to say thank you again. And uh, we look forward to you joining us for our next webinar. Thank you.